So we can now start the show with the first session. And uh, in sport, to start a show, to start an event, or to start a game, it's every time like a pressure. So maybe they will need some applause because maybe they are under pressure. Uh, so for the first session, it will be after the pandemic experience, what lessons can we draw? So yes, under your applause, one more time, Goran Genta, who is senior researcher at the Swedish schools of sports and health science, and Ulrika Sandmark, sport director at the Swedish Swimming Federation. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation from INSEP. We are very happy to be here, and I'm co-presenting with Ulrika. My name is Ulrika Sandmark, and I used to be the head coach for Swedish Swimming, 2012 in London, 2016 in Rio, and 2021 in Tokyo. Right now, I'm the sports director for all the disciplines in aquatics, swimming, paraswimming, open water, water polo, synchro, and diving. And I think the theme for the morning here about uncertainty is really exciting. And we sometimes maybe forget that uncertainty, that's really life itself. Of course, sport is uncertain. Going to big events like the big games, Olympics, Paralympics is uncertain. And put the pandemic on top of it, and it's really uncertain. So it's a great theme to address this morning. And we will try to address this by looking at the experience from both Rio and also Tokyo and compare those. And I guess we can move to the next slide. Uh, I'm doing the sports psych support and uh, head of discipline for the Swedish Sport Confederation for Sports Psychology. And when we're looking at swimming, I've been working with Ulrika and been fortunate to do that since 2013 until now. And uh, looking at sports psychology in Sweden, it's really about addressing three topics. Performance, of course, because we work with top-level athletes, but we also support the coaches, and not only the head coach, the whole staff members and the whole staff team sometimes need support with healthcare, looking after themselves, and also to address them as performance as well in the big events. And then, of course, mental health, it can be addressed either to proactively and uh, advance the well-being piece, but also sometimes address when people are struggling with minor mental health problems or bigger problems as well. So addressing performance and mental health is always crucial. And in Sweden, most of us work from a CBT perspective and more recently also heavy emphasis on acceptance commitment therapy. And we're happy to see that in the program at the very end, you will have a full uh, presentation on acceptance commitment therapy by Daniel Beer. So that's going to be great. So we're going to just touch upon it very briefly this time. So we can go on to the next. And really addressing uh, thoughts and uncertainty and emotions from a CBT perspective, I think this uh, cartoon strip really <laughs> says something about it. You are at the starting pole. <laughs> Uh, in the call room, it's a big event, you feel, I'm not really ready, so you hesitate, it's uncertain. Well, another thought pops up, it's an impossible task, I'm not going to make it. So you're still in uncertainty. Oh, it could be painful, uh, another thought pops up, and go to the next one. Oh, another thought pops up, there's too much competition in the pool, uh, still a lot of uncertainty. Another thought pops up. I can't see what's going on to happen. Really uncertain. And then another thought pops up. I can see exactly what's going to happen, and that's not comfortable. You can go to the next. <laughs> oh, I'm comfortable right here. So a lot of avoidance uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty. Conditions aren't really idle, so I'm still uncertain and hesitating. And finally, what was I waiting for when I actually dump into the pool? So at the last slide, it's really about addressing thoughts and emotions and focusing more on behavior from the acceptance commitment therapy perspective. And if we move on, uh, we really would go by Rio and contrast the experience from Rio to Tokyo. So I let Ulrika get started. I'll try to keep my balance so I don't fall off. <laughs> yes. Um, before the Olympics 2016, like one and a half year before, we created a group consisting of Joran, of course, our uh, doctor, team doctor, the Olympic coaches and me. Because we knew there would be a lot of challenges towards the uh, Brazil Olympics. 
And of course, it started with the Zika mosquito and the rumors around that. And we decided in the group to get all the information from our Swedish Olympic Committee and everything else. And then we, we stopped the rumor around our swimmers. Uh, then we had the competition schedule, and that was very strange because the prelim started at 1 p.m. and the finals at 10 p.m. That meant that our swimmers would eat dinner at 2 a.m. and go to bed at maybe 4 a.m. Very strange and a really challenge. Uh, but, and we saw that the rest of the world, uh, they did a lot of preparation in, in order to fix that. So they went to camps with these times. They prepared uh, competitions in these times. But we decided, keep it simple and just uh, adjust to this when we come to Brazil. So we, we just took it easy. Then we had the women relay. We had eight women, we had good relays, we knew that, but the energy was not in the uh, relays. Uh, eight individuals could be hard sometimes, and with females even so, I think, especially in Sweden. So me and Joran, we um, made a plan. We started in my apartment with all the girls, and they had to sit there and talk to each other about what they thought about each other's preparations before the uh, relays. It was some tears, but in the end it was really good. And then we continued to work with that because we knew these were really, really good relays. Uh, we did some activ activities like fencing and talked even more. Uh, and I think it turned out pretty good. You will see it later. Kids at Olympics. Some people say, no, no. But we said, oh, we have to fix this. Well-being and things like that, having a family. And we had two females really good ones that had two, three-year-olds. So, and their coaches were their men. So they had to have their children at the pre-camp. Uh, and uh, I asked all the swimmers on the team, is it okay? And they said, of course. And then it was like, I have a dog, I don't have children. But it was like having a dog run, running around. Everyone laughed and it was really a relaxed feeling. And I think that's very important to be able to be on and off to keep the energy. You have to have the energy at the competition, uh, not to, to um, yeah, get the energy away before. Then the pre-camp, it's very, very important that it's a good place. 2015, I went to Brazil. No, I didn't go to Brazil. I talked to someone and, and he said, this is a really good place to be at. And then we went there and it was terrible. It was the worst place we ever been at. And that was good later on because nothing could be worse. So when we had our pre-camp before Rio, it was great. Uh, and that is important. So our device all the time was keep it simple. Can I jump in? Oh, you can jump in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, I think looking at the themes uh, from the previous picture, all of these were addressing uh, uncertainty factors. Going in with the Sika, uh, looking at the very strange and uh, different competitive schedule, looking at the, I would say, challenges we have in the women's relay team, uh, bringing kids to the Olympic Village, which is very rare, which we were questioned about from a lot of other people, and especially including the Sika and the pre-camp with a terrible experience. All of those created a lot of uncertainty, but I think it was really so nice that we landed in keep it simple, don't stress out, don't make it too overcomplicated, don't overwork it, just keep it simple. So that was really the main strategy that kind of unfolded naturally in all of the discussions we had in the teams. Um, yeah. yeah, this is the, the picture <laughs> where th this is what it looks like at a national elite center sometimes when our coach has to Take care of the little son in the water polo cage. Um, Sorry, what? Uh, it looks different than the This is a, not the right presentation. Uh, we'll try to keep on and see what okay. happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I feel really uncertain. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, mm, yeah. I continue. So, yeah. This is what a typical day looked like. And then you understand that it's eight days of this. I mean, 10 
uh, this is during the Olympics in Rio, 10 breakfast and then at one or two dinner. So this was really challenging and we realized the last day at the Olympics also that the energy was running, running out. I have had, it was really good because I had Joran uh, around the team in Rio, which I didn't have in Tokyo. And this is the outcome in Rio. Uh, three medals uh, from one person, though. Uh, one gold, one silver, and one bronze, and uh, some fa finals. We were only 11 swimmers, so I think it's a really, really good outcome. Yeah, going with uncertainty even up here is pretty <laughs> amazing. And uh, uncertainty, of course, a lot of researchers have addressed what is happening to athletes, what is happening to elite sports during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of uh, games, a lot of uh, competitions, uh, a lot of restrictions, I think, affected the whole community of elite sports. So some research has shown that uh, Athletes and coaches have to deal and manage uncertainty very specifically related to the pandemic. Some of them have struggled depending on very individual situations. Some of them have been able to manage this very nicely. And even some athletes that kind of benefited <clears throat> from this pandemic situation because maybe they were injured, struggling with the qualification, and all of a sudden there was an extra year to qualify for the Olympics and do their rehab. So I think going towards Tokyo, uh, at the end, there was a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty. Will it happen? And how will it look like? Will there be spectators? Will there be demands for vaccine? Will we get the vaccine? There was a lot of uncertainty. Again, high performance sport is about uncertainty. So I think some sports actually have a great experience from trying to maintain their health, especially endurance sports is always very cautious about not getting infected. So some athletes and some sports, it wasn't really a big difference to go into the Olympics and deal with all this uncertainty related to health and the pandemic. But then we'll move on to Tokyo. See what uh, the slides look like. Think. I was standing here <laughs> thinking, what is the next slide? <clears throat> but it was right. Um, then we come to the Tokyo Olympics. And I remember the 23rd of March that I got the message that uh, the Olympics was being postponed. It was a good um, thing to get, actually, because it was some uncertainty before that. But then after that decision, it was like a lot of rumors, will it even happen? But we decided, and I think because of the, the, the group we had in Rio, that we had a really solid group, that we decided that, no, it's going to happen, and we're not going to think in another way. And in Sweden, it was really good, because we could train all the time with the best swimmers. Uh, and I think that was very, very good. And in this situation, it's also very important to have a coach that, that is goal-oriented and really refocus immediately. And we could do that uh, with our team at the National Elite Center. We started, like all of the rest of the world with a lot of digital meetings, of course, and I think it worked pretty good. Uh, but in the end of um, May, beginning June, the load of admin was so hard. It was so much. Everything started. There were apps that we were, were supposed to have. Everyone in the team were supposed to know exactly where they were supposed to be in two months. And it was, I was, Exhausted when I went to Tokyo. Totally exhausted. Um, yeah. I mean, looking at the pandemic situation again, and uh, we are from Sweden here, no masks. <laughs> I'm sure there's been a reputation about the Swedish strategy to handle the pandemic on the national level that stood out quite a bit. And that, of course, were something that were discussed among the swimmers because in Norway and Finland and Denmark, the neighbor countries, the pools were closed. They were not allowed to train, but the Swedish swimmers could train because the pools were open. Uh, and of course, that's very different in terms of how the uncertainty is creating something about, can I maintain my training schedule? Can I get in shape for the postponed Olympics? And there's no pool to train in as a swimmer. That's really a big challenge. And another difference also, I guess, is looking from outside, uh, different sports had different challenges. So 
for swimmers instance, uh, a lot of the major competitions were cancelled. Some team spurts were continuing to compete even though there were a lot of high numbers uh, that were affected by COVID, but the swimmers had hardly no competitions whatsoever. So going to the digital meeting that uh, Rika will present, I remember attending the first digital meeting with all the athletes, all the coaches, and Rika was hosting it. And still you felt a bit uncomfortable at the beginning with these uh, digital meetings and a lot of uncertainty. How is this going to work out? And some of the swimmers were stuck in the US and some of the swimmers were spread around the world and some of the swimmers were in Stockholm. So, uh, the first digital meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually not the first, but the first big one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and if we had like, like you can see here, everyone in Sweden, like uh, the coaches and swimmers in all the programs, Olympic programs, the challenger programs, we had our National Lead Center talent development program. The Swedish Olympic Committee, Swim Federation, and the support staff. I, 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 always been very, um, I think it's very important to work with the support staff close to the team. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, the psychologists, but also nutritionists and physics. So uh, we had a really, really good meeting and it was like uh, the first really good meeting before the Olympics, I think, where we gather everyone. And then uh, we had this, this slogan um, that ESSOCO uh, started, 16, 7, 30. 75. 16 um, hours of travel to Tokyo from Sweden, uh, seven days of um, uh, adjusting, uh, 30 degrees in Tokyo and 75% humidity. Uh, so I think slogans are very good for preparing mentally and this was a good one. We had three pre-qualified swimmers and they were qualified 2019. So 2020, we didn't compete at, at all, except for in our own bubble in Sweden. Uh, and then we had the pre-camp set for 2020, but we, we had the opportunity to, to um, put it forward. And we did it together with Norway. So it was very good preparation that too. And we used the same qualification as 2020. But the games was modified, as you know, and in swimming, and all the other sports, I guess. No audience and um, yeah, tests every second day. And uh, it was very special, but we were prepared. I think still, since we did such a good work in 2016 with a group, I think that meant a lot. Outcome in Tokyo, uh, not that many medals. We only took one medal, but we had four individuals uh, swimming finals. Uh, and we were very happy about that. Uh, so it was a good outcome there too. And I would also like to say that I think, at least in Sweden, uh, we, uh, the swim team, uh, benefited from, if you can say that, from, from the pandemic. <laughs> because we trained a lot, we didn't compete that much, the people that were injured got better. Thanks again, and uh, I think really addressing this pandemic and uncertain situation from both a national perspective, uh, a sport perspective, and also an individual perspective. We had one athlete that struggled with severe overtraining uh, and were stuck in the US, and uh, he would most likely not qualified for the Olympics in 2020 if that would have happened. So he got an extra year to actually get back on track, uh, rehab, do his training and qualify for the Olympics 2021. So that was a big difference for this specific athlete. And then of course, uh, as Ulrika noted, some of them were pre-qualified from the results that they did leading up to 2020. And then of course, there was a lot of uncertainty. When will there be a qualification race? When do we need to address peak performance to really qualify? And when will that happen? So a lot of uncertainty factors, but once again, that's really a part of life as being a high performance athlete and working in this community. So some of the things we addressed when we were meeting uh, with these digital meetings and also in individual sessions with athletes, it's really about looking at both challenges, but also about resources. Uh, during this pandemic and from an individual perspective. 
and also addressing anxiety and worry that is actually sometimes helpful to keep distance, wash your hands, uh, staying away from people that seems to uh, coughing a lot and looking after your health. That's really something that's really functional and adaptive when having that worry. But of course, it's a blurred line when it becomes too much anxiety and you start to have difficulties to fall asleep and you worry and ruminate all the time. So realizing that it can be both functional and adaptive and sometimes it can go too far and then that's when you need some support to address this anxiety. And uncertainty is something that is really addressed in clinical psychology, especially with general anxiety disorder. And it's mainly about being able to tolerate uncertainty. And life is uncertain. Uh, and bringing those topics and those manuals and those treatment concepts from working with general anxiety disorder has been really helpful in working with the pandemic uncertainty uh, under these conditions. And then, of course, some athletes that were maybe going to the last Olympics in 2020, and they really had been focused to maintain their motivation and be staying committed for the last year in their career. And all of a sudden, it's postponed, and maybe it's gonna happen the next year, and maybe not. So dealing with this motivational conflicts for some athletes, and also, as you know, a lot of athletes are really heavily dependent on results, uh, traditional outcome goals. So addressing the lack of motivation from an acceptance commitment perspective and looking at values was really an important thing to do during this pandemic as well. And then, of course, loss. Uh, it could be personal loss from family members, relatives uh, during this time. Isolation, maybe from uh, all the parents. Isolation from teammates. So that is, of course, something that everyone experienced as well. And once again, rumination and potentially depression symptoms was important to uh, screen and look after. But then also, as I said at the beginning, looking at the resources uh, that some had, and I was actually looking at a recent paper in the journal Creativity, that really creativity is dependent on uncertainty. If there is no uncertainty, it is difficult to be creative. So being creative and finding new solutions, how should we react to each other? How should we prepare? How will the next season be when there is no traveling to high altitude training camps here in France <laughs> and just all the training camps will be local in Sweden? So being creative and finding new solution, that was something that was actually driven by this uncertainty. And then, of course, uh, everyone has different resources and being able to build upon those. Uh, and also, I think one of the key strategies was really looking at values that were more important things in both life and in sports to address these uh, topics more heavily during the pandemic situation. And I think those that's been working within sports psych had more opportunities to sit down with athletes and address these topics before it was something that maybe we didn't address enough. Uh, so one slide on the acceptance commitment therapy which you will have a big lesson on at the end by Daniel Birrer. Uh, so I'm just very briefly gonna mention this. There's three core pillars in this uh, theory, uh, being open, being aware, and being engaged. And being open is really about accepting things just like it is. And that was really important with addressing the tolerance of uncertainty. Diffusion is really about being able to have some space to your thoughts and your emotions and being open to this is just thoughts like clouds in the sky, it's not me. And then being fully present in the moment is of course so important in competition and also of course in training and in relationships as well. And the third core pillar is committed actions, doing important things despite all these restrictions following in your daily routines, eating, training, practice on daily hours and doing the best thing you can that's important to you. And once again, this is a 
altogether addressing a psychological flexibility that is so much needed in uncertainty. Because the opposite would be, you're rigid, I cannot do what I used to do, it's not gonna work. It's a black and white thinking when you're really rigid and that's not gonna help and that's also very often linked and associated to mental health problems. But once again, uh, Daniel Biller will address this uh, at the end of the conference tomorrow so we can move on <coughs> and see some uh, things we actually did that Ulrika didn't talk so much about is um, looking at the health and self-care of the coaches. And as Ulrika noted, she was really exhausted at the end of uh, Tokyo Games because of the high admin load and all the things that went into it. So this is actually from the conference last week in Portugal, the coaching conference. So we were really keen on supporting the coach staff because sometimes we think that only the athletes is those that need support to maintain a sustainable mental health leading into big events, but it's just as important for the coaches as well. So you can move, I'm not gonna do the whole presentation because <laughs> uh, that would take up all the time. So this is basically uh, the last slide of that presentation. So we were actually able to see that this intervention with a number of 18 swim coaches covering three swim disciplines increased their self-compassion, which also have the potential to support self-care and sustainability in a very demanding profession as being a high-performance coach. And we also saw some of them were rating low energy and mood over a period of time. Some of them were rating high mood and energy over time. And we, when we looked at those different groups, it appeared to be uh, the experience as a head coach. And that means really how important it is to have an experienced head coach and mixing that maybe with more younger, more development type of coaches. And also it seemed like no matter if you were high or low in energy, it seemed that self-reflection uh, was really important and self-awareness increased during this intervention. And finally, I think it is important to really do support coaches and not just primarily do the work with athletes. Because if you look at research with interventions that is supporting performance enhancement and well-being, they primarily focus on athletes and not so much on the coaches. So finally, <clears throat> a few more slides before we end and open up for questions. This intervention was really asking the coach every evening during eight weeks to reflect about their energy, their mood, and the highlight. And this was supported by a coordinator that sent out a text message to their phone, and they replied, and the response rate was amazing, 99% for these 18 coaches every day during eight weeks. So I think this pretty simple intervention has been really beneficial in terms of addressing self-care. And finally, to cite Dalai Lama, uh, caring for others requires also caring for oneself. And I think sometimes when you are struggling with resources, work with the athletes, work with the athletes, but also not forgetting how important the coaches are to support the athletes, like they do when you get into a flight and uh, they give you the safety instructions. If the oxygen <coughs> goes down in the cabin, as an adult, put on your mask first and then support the one behind you or beside you. So I think that is the same analogy that we would like to use for the head coaches. We need to support them so they can support others and really fostering self-care. And maybe a comment on that and the last slide. How important it is to address self-care. <laughs> I don't know if I'm very good at it, but <laughs> of course it's very important. And I think that is a good uh, thing that you said about the oxygen masks that, that uh, illustrates the whole thing, I think. And I think we were doing it within 29 minutes and we have 30 minutes, so <laughs> hopefully we reached the goal we, we you have. <laughs> Congrats for the results and congrats for the presentation. So it's, it's you on the picture. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> uh, so if you have some questions, 
Uh, it can be on the room, it can be also on the internet. Do not hesitate. Um, I have one question. Um, do, do you feel your athletes, or maybe your coach also, after all this uncertainty, uh, now became different uh, when they go to training, when they go to competition? Like if after Tokyo, it was like a hidden gift because all this uncertainty, maybe it's a hidden gift, I don't know. Do they become different? We talked about that before, that I, we think this was really good for developing people. I mean, uh, now you think, I mean, of course, the sports is everything, but now it's more in a context. And uh, I think that's very good for everyone to reflect on that. Yeah, for Tokyo, you told, but for years, maybe in three, four years, maybe for Paris 2024, maybe in, if they will keep the experience of uh, this uncertainty. Yeah. I think learning how to handle uncertainty, and I recall one session with one athlete that really before this pandemic always struggled with lack of control, uh, lack of uncertainty. And during this pandemic, this athlete told me, I had so much time to practice being with uncertainty, some become a professional handling uncertainty. So I think that's going to last. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, hello, uh, excellent presentation, uh, wonderful photo with the other uh, coaches from other countries. <laughs> okay. Interesting. <Belgium>. Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for no that. French, no. no, and the French, yeah, but okay. Um, no, uh, I fully uh, agree with uh, the support from athletes and coaches, but also for the support staff. Mm. Now, my question would be, uh, how did the support staff and especially the psychologist cope with the uncertainty? and all the COVID uh, uh, challenges? <laughs> uh, I guess uh, I can speak for myself. And sometimes working with sports psychology support and realizing I also need to struggle with all this uncertainty at the same time supporting athletes and coaches with exactly the same topic. Uh, and I think we need to be humble to say it is a challenge. And I can maybe give a specific example. Uh, I had COVID in the Easter in April, and then I was supposed to go to the European Championships in uh, Hungary to attend and be there on site. And the medical doctor warned me that after you become well from uh, COVID, you might still test positive with the antigen test. So about five days before the departure, I did for safety, one test, I was green, I was able to go. And then I did a test 24 hours before leaving. And 15 minutes before going to the airport with a taxi, the medical doctor told me, unfortunately, your last test is not what you wanted. <laughs> and of course, at that moment, you have this rush of very negative thoughts and emotions and uh, creating a lot of frustrations and uh, I remember calling Erika, I'm stuck in Sweden, I'm not coming. Uh, and of course, then being able to refocus and say, well, I'm going to do the normal thing during the pandemic and support them through a remote by online digital meetings. I think we need to be <clears throat> humble to say that we also need to struggle with these uh, uncertainty factors. And uh, I was on the long list uh, going to Tokyo, but they need, needed to cut uh, a couple of people. So I was doing Tokyo from my summer house up north in Sweden in the midnight sun. <laughs> so being able to refocus and still do that work. But I think peer mentoring is important for us uh, that delivers sports psych support at this level as well. Morning. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I got a question on the family stability that you present uh, for Rio. Uh, you um, you say that um, family stability was important for athletes. Uh, that uh, family being around was uh, the main uh, things that can bring stability for them. But how do you manage that with the Tokyo preparation? and the Tokyo Olympics where family were not allowed? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> they were not there. 
the, the two females with the children, they were, were not qualified for the Olympics in Tokyo. So that, that was not a problem. That would have been a problem, yes. Yeah. But I think we were sort of a little bit prepared on that anyways. I mean, since we've been isolated in our own countries already. I think that we would be a little bit more pre prepared. But it was not a problem this time. Good morning. You made a direct reference to uncertainty connected to creativity. Mm -hmm. Would you mind giving us some examples of creativity fits, things you implemented when facing uh, mental training processes? Yeah, I guess uh, I just downloaded the article last night, but I can give some examples fr from the year because the article uh, I was just reading, the abstract, really resonated. Because when you're sitting uh, with athletes face to face in a room, especially working with uh, acceptance commitment therapy, there is a lot of exercises you can do in the room together. So being able to be creative and finding exercises when you are meeting someone uh, on a screen, you need to really think outside of the box. Uh, and adapting the exercises to what's going on in your environment. So I won't give you any specific examples, but that's been really so important to be creative. And also talking to uh, coaches, uh, and now I'm uh, reflecting to Swedish Biathlon, that typically go on a lot of training camps outside of Sweden uh, to prepare. And all of a sudden we were just in Sweden for the longest period of time. So being able to find creative solutions that actually would be beneficial for the athletes and the coaches was important as well. So uh, I'm not going to give you any specific examples, but uh, I think it really means you have to work hard to find creative solutions, especially finding solutions to be social and connecting to people, uh, like having after work sessions uh, on Zoom or <laughs> Teams, uh, uh, finding different solutions is important. Thank you. Is there any last question? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> you, you've, you've had an we have had an experience of a sudden break with the COVID period. And uh, we, I think that we are going to have some ups and, and downs for maybe two, three years uh, to come. So uh, what, what did you learn that we could use to, to cope uh, with these ups and downs with uh, COVID to, that we can expect? I think we can maybe address this question, both of us, but uh, I think really working more regularly with values and not so much only focusing on outcome goals and results and big competitions. And I think that is a piece of work that we haven't really addressed enough before. So I think addressing values, and for those who are not familiar with values from ACT, you will have Daniel at the end, but for instance, going to the Olympics, getting married, uh, getting two kids, that's outcome goals that you can tick off. But being a loving parent or a loving partner, you never tick those off. So being connected with values is very different than looking at doing personal best at the next big event. So I think that piece of work in sports psychology has been really important. I think we can address that way more in the future as well. And then, of course, the uncertainty piece and being able to accept those uh, aspects, both in life, in sport. Uh, no athlete know if they will be sick or injured just before the big events. So uncertainty will be there always. So working with uncertainty from a sp psychological perspective with acceptance and then the values. I think those pieces will be something that we can continue to learn from. Self-care. And self-care, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ulrika. Thank you, Göran. Thank you.